Welcome to Patriots Podium, a bi-weekly podcast from the New York State Conservative Party, when newsmakers, political leaders, and conservative leaders take a few minutes to discuss issues, current events, and politics with us. I'm Conservative Party State Chairman Jerry Kassar. Today, I'm excited to be joined by New York State Senator George Borrello, the chairman of the Senate Republican Campaign Committee, SRCC, as it's often known. George hails from Chautauqua County, a former county executive and local elected official, George uh, and his wife Kelly are active members of the hospitality and restaurant community. Um, George, it's great seeing you. Jerry, it's good to be on with you. Thank you for having me on. Well, you're very welcome, very welcome. George, uh, you were first elected to the uh, state Senate in 219 uh, while serving as the Chautauqua County Executive. What is in your takeaway on Albany after spending a number of years in local government? Well, here's what I will tell you. After spending 10 years in local government, if state government ran half as well as county government does, New York State would be a much better, safer, and affordable place to live. Uh, you know, the, the problem here in Albany that I have come to find in, in uh, you know, a little over four years is that uh, quite literally corruption is built into the in, into the infrastructure here, uh, and uh, it's it's frustrating at times because uh, you know what what I will first say is that uh, every single person in New York State, 19 and a half million people, we all have representatives uh, in the state legislature, the Senate, and the Assembly. They're all taxpayers. They're all voters. They're all people that are contributing to our to our state. Uh, but yet it's only those th that uh, are in the majority in, in the the supermajority of Democrats that essentially uh, get uh, the, the, the greatest return uh, on that. So it's everybody's money that goes into this big pot that we call the New York State budget. But it's only uh, certain groups uh, that can uh, th that probably benefit the most and largely for political reasons. That's just not the case how it is in, in, in county government or any local government. Uh, and uh, that's probably the biggest, uh, I would say, fundamental thing that needs to be fixed in Albany. We need to take the corruption out of the system. Well, my own experience with Albany over the years was that the partisanship really had very little to do with good government. It was really, I mean, you could have a great idea and not be in the majority within the legislative body and your biggest hope is that they steal your idea so at least it will get somewhere. And that's pretty, I mean, that's if that sounds cynical, it really is very cynical. Very, well, I, I, I'm sorry, George. It's, it's, it's true. In fact, just this morning, uh, we did a uh, press conference on a very important bill uh, for agriculture for our farmers that would uh, give uh, apply basically a mistake that was made last year uh, on a, a tax credit uh, for building housing that doesn't apply to actual Workforce housing. It's a you know it, it's uh, it applies to barns and garages and everything else, but not to to workforce housing. And you know that should be a non-political, you know, a non-partisan issue that could should easily be fixed. But because it's carried by a Republican, uh, we're going to have to you know uh, push and push hard. Um, and and, and that's, that's just not the way it should be. It's not good government. It's not transparent government. And it's certainly not government that serves the most people. Well, I mean, I also I, I think that's one of the uh, driving forces behind people becoming so disenchanted with the uh, with New York State. I mean, you you look for I mean, maybe maybe government cannot always help you, but you certainly don't want them to ignore you. And when you have attitudes like that, that that can happen. But let me get uh, this more basic question. In your view, what is the biggest issue these days affecting our state? Well, without a doubt, uh, I have to believe it's uh, it's public safety. Um, that's the grounds for everything, right? I mean, if people don't feel safe, uh, they, they don't want to live here. And and that public safety, it's not just about uh, you know more police or or, or even the laws uh, that have made you know this a haven for criminals, uh, the criminal coddling of, of the Democrats. It's really about every way the, the state operates. Uh, you know, you look at the. Uh, the, the self-created migrant crisis uh, in New York State, where we have hundreds of thousands of people that have come here because we've rolled out the welcome mat. Uh, that's a public safety issue, too. Uh, you know, New York City right now is dealing with, at last count, about 140,000 people that have come here illegally. Uh, this is certainly Joe Biden's fault for, for having an open border policy, uh, but it's also New York State's fault. Uh, because if you look at where these people land, they're landing in sanctuary cities and sanctuary states. That's uh, so th that has created a huge public safety crisis. It's created a public health crisis. Uh, 
um, you know, there, there was, uh, there, are, there are migrants everywhere. Uh, these folks um, are not here because they're looking for a better life in America. They're here because they're told they're going to be taken care of. They're going to get free housing, free food, free health care. And now, thanks to Governor Hochul, they'll probably get uh, government jobs. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so New York State, uh, the, the safety of, and, and security of the people of New York State has been jeopardized. Uh, by uh, a Democratic Party that uh, is welcoming this to our state. Let me ask you this: you know, to that point, um, you know, they 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 are they are coming into the into our country basically through an asylum type argument, which obviously never really gets adjudicated. But have you seen any of those YouTubes or those uh, those those videos from some of these uh, left wing groups that attempt to explain? potential migrants on how they can subvert our laws by making claims of asylum ship when they really have no legitimate right, but they are being trained on how to get into the country. Have you seen any of that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt that. And by the way, some of those groups are NGOs. These are these are organizations funded by the federal government uh, that are that are essentially uh, telling th these folks that are here illegally how to uh, may, you know how to to subvert the system and claim asylum. You know, you you've heard from countless groups that have you know looked at this that uh, we know for a fact that 90 plus percent of those people do not have a legitimate claim of asylum. And uh, so this is orchestrated by by these groups, but it's also backed by the federal government, uh, because when the federal government you know, you know captures someone, uh, and in most cases those people literally just walk up to uh, you know in, to the to the border patrol and say I'm turning myself in and I'm seeking asylum, uh, they have that script, uh, and then uh, the worst part about it is uh, you know, under the previous administration or the Trump administration those people would be sent uh, back across the border to Mexico to await their hearing instead. These people are released into the United States. We have no idea their background. Uh, we have no idea where they'll end up. Uh, and they've been told to uh, come back to a hearing that's likely years in the future. And even then, most the, the history is the vast majority don't show up. So mm -hmm. this is a complete failure. It is a national security crisis. And quite frankly, I think Joe Biden is guilty of treason by allowing this. Hmm. Well, you're not alone in that view. But let me ask you... Uh, you know, they say there's no uh, Democratic or Republican way to, fo to fix a pothole, but I mean, I think we know that that's actually not true. Uh, besides the obvious that divided government is better than one party rule, could you discuss why you consider Republican solutions better than Democratic ones? Well, because, uh, you know, in general, uh, you know, the, the Republican Party is aligned with conservative principles. And, and our conservative principles uh, uh, dictate that uh, less government is better. Uh, and that the solution is uh, is to allow, number one, the free market uh, to, to determine how things happen. The Democrats never met a law they didn't like, never met a regulation they didn't like, never met a tax that they didn't like. And they believe that they know better than the, than the people that, uh, say, operate a business or, or uh, you know, how to, how to run their family, how to run their business, how to run their lives. Uh, you know, we... we, we, we have bills every day in the New York State Legislature that are about the government dictating how you will run your life, how your children will be handled, how your land will be used, uh, and essentially uh, they know better than you about everything, including your own family. And that's the fundamental difference. Uh, you know, the, the reality is, is there a Democrat or Republican way to fix a pothole? No, but there are there are problems with the fact that we're doing more than fixing potholes. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, who's allowed to use a public bathroom and, and, uh, and uh, uh, how, how much money you're going to have to spend uh, to drive uh, from, uh, you know, into the city of New York uh, because of, of, of oppressive tolls and things like congestion pricing. Uh, you know, so the Democrat way is always we will tell you. Uh, how your life will be lived. And that is just not how the Republican Republican Party works, and certainly not the Republicans in New York State. You know, we used to say that, and we actually still say in the city, uh, well, a Republican will fix the pothole or a conservative by simply filling in the pothole, where a Democrat will tear up the entire street and make it a, a work, you know, a work project to hire, a, you know, 25 people to repair the street when you just had a pothole. So, I mean, I, I do think... Um, I mean, I do think there are some very basic inherent reasons why it's better to elect 
conservatives on you know on, on that local on that local level besides you know what we know is going on in dc are in albany so um you know i appreciate you you, you know you as a county exec certainly certainly uh, knew and understood how to operate that way so let me ask you this um the governor in Hochul's state budget, and I've, I've got a little bit to say on this, was the most expensive in history, yet major issues such as public safety, fiscal sanity, the immigration crisis, overreaching environmental policies such as requiring school buses to be electric and gas stoves banned, parental rights, public health quarantine regulations, congestion pricing, and the protection of the Second Amendment went unaddressed. Then, of course, the Assembly and State Senate majorities, the Democrats, came back with even more expensive budgets that raise taxes too. I mean, yep. first, has Albany gone insane? And let me ask you, um, I, the GOP, you're offering alternatives, I believe. Yeah. Yes. And will the Senate GOP likely vote no on what we are now seeing, what we're seeing right now? Well, you know, look, you've got to look at it this way. You know, these budgets are massive. Um, they're, they're, it's tens of thousands of pages. And um, we're asked to address this in a relatively short period of time. But what makes it uh, the worst and probably the reason why we are going to, you know, likely vote no is because there's a lot of bad policy hidden in this budget also. I, as you said, I was a county executive. We put together a budget. A budget is based on projecting revenue and uh, approving uh, and projecting expenses. That's what a budget is supposed to be. But what have we dealt with in the past in, in budgets? We've dealt with controversial issues like bail reform, you know, you know, all these other uh, horrible uh, uh, so-called criminal justice reforms uh, that, that uh, were essentially taken up as part of the budget to provide cover, quite frankly, for state legislators where they know this particular uh, policy issue isn't going to be popular in their district. So uh, those are the things that are hidden in these budgets. I actually am part of a bipartisan group of people uh, that uh, have a bill to, to take policy out of the budget process. It's the reason why our budgets are late. And uh, you know the, the, the rank and file members on both sides of the aisle uh, agree um, th th this thing has a lot of co-sponsors that we should not be discussing uh, policy issues in the budget. It, it also, it empowers the governor in, in too many ways as well. So, you know, we're going to vote no, most likely. Uh, there may be, there's 10 parts to the budget. Uh, is there some parts that potentially some Republicans could support for some reason? Potentially. But the overarching problem is, is you are taking essentially uh, thousands and thousands of, uh, of, of expenditures and, and policies, and uh, you're condensing it down to essentially 10 votes. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people also don't realize that um, the budget is a mechanism for getting around home rule. And home is. rule, I mean, home rule is local government, and it requires you basically to have the approval of a local government before you could, you know, take certain actions. But when they put it in the state budget, they are actually going to make an argument that has some sort of statewide effect, which to be blunt about it, these home rule councils are really functionaries of these majorities and they can manipulate things in such a way that you are overwhelming a local government through, you know, heavy handed Albany tactics. Uh, I mean, Albany is a place where cynicism for the general public is probably uh, the right attitude to have in general. So uh, let me ask you this then. You're in a unique position to challenge the above that we've talked about because you chair the Senate Republican Campaign Committee. Yes. Uh, right now, the Senate GOP is one seat short of breaking the two-thirds majorities. They call it a supermajority that are held by the liberals in the Senate and the assembly GOP, I think is, I, mean, I think they're three seats short, short of doing the same. Why is it real? Why is it important, George, that we break these super majorities? It's very important because right now, um, the, the Democrats have the ability to override any veto of the government of the governors. Uh, now they rarely do, but in, in behind closed, closed door negotiations, they, they wield that, uh, as part of their negotiation, that if they really don't like what the governor has done, they can override the veto. So by uh, breaking the supermajority, you know, a supermajority is required in order to override a veto. And that means that uh, if, if we have, and, you know, just 
more than one uh, Republican uh, in either house. And in the case of the Senate, it's only one seat, as you mentioned. That means they no longer have that supermajority on one side of the aisle to override the governor. Now, uh, that certainly requires a governor with a spine that's willing to actually say, look at, uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to override this veto uh, without Republican votes. Uh, therefore, I'm, this is what I want. Um, Kathy Hochul has, uh, has not shown much of a spine, quite honestly. She's let the, the, the Democrat majorities you know, steamroll her on a number of things. Uh, probably the most egregious one was she signed a, a record pay increase for, the, uh, for state legislators without getting anything for it. Uh, and when we were literally days away from the end of the year uh, back in 2022. However, she has shown a little bit of spine in in, uh, in vetoing a bill that would have really rigged the public campaign finance system in in, uh, in favor of incumbent Democrats, uh, which was passed through uh, through, through the uh, the Senate and the Assembly uh, last session. So taking away the supermajority means that um, Republicans will have to be involved in any kind of a veto override, which would hopefully give uh, us a, a seat at the table, at least with the governor. Uh, but it also means that, um, you know, they, they're not going to be able to ramrod through all these harmful bills uh, you know, w- without at least the, the threat of a governor that could uh, that could actually uh, veto them and they have no way to override that. So it's very, very important. Uh, uh, look, uh, the, the reality is we need to restore balance in government, and that is going, only going to happen when we restore uh, Republicans in the majority in the state Senate, and that's certainly uh, the mission that I'm on. But um, it's also good for every New Yorker. I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, conservative, uh, you know, not affiliated voter, whatever it is, um, you want a, a government that doesn't have one party rule because we're seeing what has happened. I mean, New York State uh, leads the nation in every bad statistic. Let's face it, uh, worst place to do business, uh, most out migration, uh, you, you name it, New York State uh, is the worst. Uh, and that has happened largely since one party rule took over in 2019. So, as I mentioned, you are the chairman of the Senate Republican Campaign Committee, and uh, petitioning is in for public office is in uh, full swing right now. How has candidate recruitment gone? Candidate recruitment has been excellent. Um, First and foremost, we have currently 21 members uh, of the the New York State Senate that are Republicans. All 21 are coming back, no retirements, nobody's leaving. Uh, We also have have, uh, recruited. 24 candidates across New York State, and uh, uh, I would say a record number in the in the five boroughs uh, of New York City, and uh, you know that. So we have uh, we have 45 uh, candidates, uh, which would literally uh, more than flip the the Senate from a supermajority Democrat to supermajority Republicans. That's a heavy lift, I know. Uh, but we need to flip 11 seats just to take back the majority, uh, which would be key to, to stopping this runaway train uh, of one party rule here in New York State. We're very focused on that because the fate of our state literally depends on it. So let me ask you, uh, it, is a, it is a presidential election year, a national election year. Congress is up to, obviously. Uh, we have a U.S. Senate seat up in New York. Uh, how, are these, uh, how are these national elections going to play into our local elections? Well, a, you know, um, as you are sure well aware, the most expensive races are going to be, uh, you know, these the presidential race and followed by, you know, the House and Senate races. So a lot of money is going to be, uh, you know, infused into those races. And that affects all of our candidates down ballot from the president and, and the United States Senate and, and uh, House of Representatives. Um, that means that, um, you know, we are going to have to, in some ways, uh, we're, we're going to be aligned very closely with our with our uh, candidates of, uh, up the ballot. It matters not as much who the president of the United States is in your quality of life here in New York State. It really matters who's running your state government. Uh, and it particularly matters uh, who your state legislator is and what goals they're looking for. If you're concerned about, um, you know, uh, the public safety, the crime, the migrants that are overrunning our state, uh, the Democrats only for every single bit of that. Uh, you know, the, the governor... Uh, for example, could undo the state's sanctuary policy with a stroke of her pen uh, because it was done by executive order by disgraced former Governor Andrew Cuomo. But she's yet to do that. So we really need uh, Republicans that, that are going to be standing up. Uh, you know, we, we stand up every day. Uh, 
we're, we, we, are, uh, we are a feisty group that's fighting hard and getting the message out there, but we just need more of us. And that is no matter, like I said, no matter where you stand uh, from a political affiliation standpoint should be the thing that you want is to restore some balance to, to government. And we have more than enough candidates uh, to return the Republicans uh, to to uh, to power in the state senate, and uh, our you know the the the, uh, the, the candidates above us, um, you know quite frankly have less impact on your lives than who your state senator and state assemblyman is. Yeah, true, I very much agree with that. I thank you, George, for your time and commitment to the conservative movement and bringing about uh, change in Albany. Do you have any uh, final words for our audience? Yes. First of all, I want to thank you, Jerry, and the Conservative Party uh, for for still being uh, great champions, uh, despite everything that's happened in New York State. You know, the, if you look at a map of the state of New York, uh, the red areas far out uh, outweigh the blue areas geographically. New York State uh, is really a Republican state in so many ways, a conservative state in so many ways. Uh, but uh, the loudest, uh, most radical voices of the Democratic Party control that party. And they are the ones that have led this charge uh, to, to destroy our, our state, to turn it into some kind of socialist dystopia. Um, but there is hope. Uh, people are realizing this, even folks that are, were normally sympathetic uh, to the Democratic Party. I know lifelong Democrats, you know, working class folks that became Democrats, the candidate Democrats, if you will, that are fed up. Uh, they're fed up with the, the, the radical agenda. Uh, and therein lies our opportunity. Uh, but conservative values are always that that guiding light, that north star for us, and it is the right way, not just to run government, but to run our to run our own lives. So I, I'm proud to stand uh, for conservative values, and it will be the way out of this mess, in my opinion. Well, we've been joined by uh, State Senator George Borello, and once again, I'd like to thank for being here. And he's the chairman of the Senate Republican Campaign Committee. Uh, the conservative party shares the same goals as the gop senate and working uh, to overcome the radical state senate democrats who uh, may hold the majority but i do not think in many cases hold the hearts of the uh, average new york voter uh to that point george i know my uh my county committees and the state party will be working alongside you uh this entire period you know we obviously have cross endorsed uh pretty much everybody uh, that you guys are pushing. And we look forward, uh, you know, to a lot of wins this November. I mean, we, I think the national elections are going to turn out a larger vote, which in some parts of the state, you know, will actually be very beneficial to us. In some parts, they're going to, you know, the argument will be they won't be. But I do think that since many of these New York state issues, such as the migrant issue, kind of have a local nexus and a national nexus, that people are going to be thinking pretty much the same way as they vote for president, Congress, state senator, or state assembly. So once again, I'd like to thank uh, Andrew Davis and uh, Katie Mahone, who uh, produce uh, this podcast. This is Patriots Podium. I'm State Chairman Jerry Kassar. <laughs>